Monaco Yacht Show is the most important yacht show in the world, hands down. Monaco will always be Monaco. There will be growth, Dubai and other places around the world, Monaco is Monaco. The boats here are simply the, the, the best in the world and they've got submarines, they've got you know, endless toys on there, ballrooms. For anyone who works in the yachting business, it's pretty much the busiest week of the year. The biggest gathering of ludicrously expensive uh, toys on the planet. Coming up in this program, the Luxury Channel gets a rare glimpse into the exclusive world of super yachts. And here's from the designers, builders and owners about what life is really like aboard some of the world's most expensive ocean-going private boats. To sum it up, we make dreams come true. That's it. The tiny principality of Monaco has long been known as the playground of the rich and famous. But for one week in every year, the glitz and the glamour really comes to town when Monaco hosts the most prestigious and important yachting show on the planet. Buyers from every continent fly here in private jets to see what's on offer at the show. There are one or two yachts that are just too big to get into this show, but if it's a large yacht for sale, it will be here in Monaco. What you have here obviously are brokers who are responsible for selling these yachts, interior designers, exterior designers, naval architects, suppliers of audiovisual systems. It's also obviously a place to learn about the latest things that are available technologically for the next designs. By day, the serious business of boat buying takes place. And by night, the champagne flows freely in five-star hotels and elite harbourside venues. And while the parties are in full swing, organisers and crews busily prepare the event and its boats for close scrutiny. The buyers expect absolute perfection. One frayed rope could mean a lost sale. You consider the lifestyle that these boat owners are coming from, more than anything, they want a no fuss, no bother, all-encompassing amenity. You know, when you're selling very, very expensive products to people, they expect a certain standard. The cost, we used to say, was about a million euros a meter. But, and once you get above about 60 meters, or even 55, one million a meter doesn't work anymore because the volume increases. I have heard of at least one project which was ballpark costed at 600 million euros. That means that the person who is purchasing that has actually got that much to spare on a leisure item. It is extraordinary, the money that, that's involved in these yachts, but, you know, that, that really feeds the market in itself. As well as the buyers themselves, the Monaco Yacht Show attracts the best boat builders and biggest yacht brokers from all over the world. The yachts themselves come in all shapes and large sizes, from the ultra-modern to the more classic like the 2002 launched 87-foot J-Class replica Ranger. This is a boat that stands out among all the other plastic boats uh, around us right now. It feels different than what you might think on a contemporary yacht because contemporary yachts are much lighter and they surf a little bit. This boat gets a going and it doesn't stop. It keeps going. She's a reincarnation of the J-Class boats that raced so long ago. She has uh, beautiful accommodations, which the original boat didn't have. Uh, there's four cabins aft, and although there's variations because of flexibility of her cabins, she sleeps eight people aft, and she sleeps eight people forward. She couldn't be duplicated again today. All of the panels, all of the uh, veneers are all matched. The teak decks are from logs that were so big they hardly fit in the kill to dry them. And the labor and the, and the man hours that went into this boat today, it would cost 25, 26, 27 million euros to duplicate if in fact you could get the same quality and that would be difficult.
16 million euros is the asking price. She's here in Monaco because uh, now the owner's got some new plans and wants to sell her. I was told today that he may get a, he may get divorced by his wife if he does sell it, but that's something between he and his wife. Despite the global economic slowdown, there's no indication whatsoever of a decline in the super yacht market. The trend is yachts are continuing to get larger, more expensive, and more sophisticated, and that I think will always be a trend. There's three contracts out to bid at the moment of 142, 142 and 200 meters, uh, which is in insanely big. Despite a so-called financial slowdown globally, the leading shipyards will still not have availability for four, maybe five years for a large motor yacht. We're dealing with people at the very, very, very top end, and to a large degree, they don't get affected by what goes on in the world economy. Good news for Wally Yachts, who, along with their motorboats, are showcasing the brand new 148-foot Saudade which is to date their largest built super yacht. We came to the Monaco Yacht Show a bit worried uh, about what was happening about in the financial world, but we are very happy. We have a lot of, not visitors, but really clients interested both in sail, our sail yachts and our power boats. This boat is uh, really in a new league. It, along with another handful in the world, there's not too many of them of this really high performance calibre. And uh, really, there's no comparing with what I've sailed before. We've been away from the dock now for about six weeks, so uh, she's pretty new. I think that the first characteristics that distinguish Wallis from the other yards are, is the technology. The materials we use and the performances we get with our boats. Then we also have the style and all these composite materials, titanium, which allow our boats to have much, much higher performances than any other boat. Any little details of the finishing in the engine room, the rigging, even the sails is very, very important to give you not only performances, but to give you quality and to give you that style that you're looking for. We operate with six crew full time, but sailing wise, you can pretty much sail the boat with three or four just for actually sailing, maneuvering ability and things like that. Um, but we have a, a full complement of crew, full time engineer, full time chef, one interior crew and the rest of the guys are generally on deck with me. Saudade is at Monaco for display purposes only. She's not for sale and the price to build another like her, well that's a closely guarded secret. One of the undoubted stars of the show is the alloy yachts built Kokomo. Launched in 2006, the two-year-old boat is here at the show for sale by her present owner. With a full-time crew of 12, she can accommodate 12 guests in total ocean-going luxury. The asking price for the 169-foot super yacht? A cool 28 million euros. But what, once you've bought a boat like Kokomo, can you do with her? Caribbean and Mediterranean cruising, of course. But what about something a little more exciting? I run the Super Yacht Cup regattas, which are two four-day sailing regattas for these yachts. We hold one in Palma at the end of June and one in Antigua at the beginning of December. The timing is such to, to coincide with the migration of the Super Yachts. I call it a migration between the Caribbean and the, and the Mediterranean. The Super Yacht Cup we created 13 years ago in Palma. It really started as a, as a captain's cocktail party and has evolved over the years into a four-day sailing regatta, a very fun and informal sailing regatta for, for owners to enjoy. These type of yachts are not always built for racing. Uh, really, they're built for, for cruising and, and more so these days for performance cruising. And what we allow over four days with the Super Yacht Cup regattas is for these yachts to sail together in a safe, informal, but above all, fun environment with dock parties, barbecues, paella parties in Spain. And the same applies in the Caribbean as well.
boats are built simply to sail, or most of these boats are of this size, uh, are built simply to sail around the world. And, and therefore, really, your world's are oyster. You can live aboard, you can have guests aboard. Often with, with the owners, they have very busy schedules. They tend to meet up with the boat in various parts of the world. But for those that really want to take the time out and sail around the world, these boats are the best in the world to do it with. The Monaco Yacht Show was founded in 1990, and the annual event now attracts over 28,000 visitors, the world's press, and 500 exhibitors. Each September, billions of euros worth of the world's biggest, most extravagant vessels squeeze into the exclusive harbour, each paying between 17 and 60,000 euros for the privilege. Of the 95 yachts on display this year, 40 are brand new boats, some of them for sale, some of them just for show. It's one of the only places in the world where an oligarch with a glass of champagne in hand can see exactly what's for sale. Or he can commission a yacht and decide there and then whether he wants to equip it with either a helicopter or a submarine or both. And it's a place where size really does matter. Yachting is, of course, a multi-billion euro industry. Monaco is the number one event in the yachting calendar, but exactly who is buying them and what are they using them for? The critical thing about the super yacht is that it's for pleasure, whereas a commercial ship, reason for being there is profit. And although many of the regulations that govern ships govern our industry, it's about pleasure. I mean, toy is, is a bit of a, a sort of unfair way of putting it. It's not really a toy. In many cases, that you can sort of regard it as a mobile beach house, and often the, the decor and style of many of them reflects that. This pretty navi that we're sitting in, I mean, as you look around you, you can see it's, it's very light, it's a sort of casual, relaxed place, um, but one that moves around, which is, which is pretty exciting. We are covering the larger end of the market almost directly in harmony with what you see here. 24 meters and up, um, we're read by owners, designers, brokers, captains, crews, and everybody associated with the business of yachting. What we do is we look at interesting yachts for whatever may make them interesting. Interesting because of a technical feature, interesting because of what they represent to that particular yacht building business, and so on. So it's about the business of super yachting. Like most people in the industry, Talk Buckley has no doubt about its future. Could the whole industry crash and burn? I don't really think so. It has consistently grown. You know, the, the growth curve wobbles a bit, but it doesn't really crash. There's a certain inertia. Mr. A has a yacht, so Mr. B sees Mr. A has a yacht. Suddenly the idea develops. It's almost like a fashion, and, and you have to have it. Coming up later, we meet the designers and builders of some of the most impressive sailing yachts in the world and we hear from the owner of arguably the star of the show. As this program has already learnt, it can take at least four years to build the boat of your dreams. From finding the broker and designer to waiting for the right shipyard to become available is a time-consuming occupation. Here, at the 2008 Monaco Yacht Show, the world's best boat designers and yacht builders have many of their past achievements on display, including the Italian company Perini Navi, who have one of the top reputations at Monaco. Perini Navi is uh, the company that is most of the sailing yacht uh, above, uh, let's say, 150 meters, although we have also other uh, smaller. Today we are on board of the sailing yacht Salute, new 66 meters of Perini. This boat is a sloop, uh, she is the only one sloop in this small family. Uh, the head draft of the mast is 75 meters from the water, so uh, it is the tallest mast in aluminium ever built in the world. The boat has also another feature that gives her something different from the other. She has a forward cockpit. The interior has been done by Remy Tessier, He's an interior designer, he's a French guy that works with us uh, since now a couple of years. And uh, he worked uh, with uh, us and with the client. Uh, and 
I think the results is absolutely positive and gorgeous. When I meet the owner, after one hour, for me, it's very clear if we can do something together or not. After one month, I present to them one cabin, maybe the, the owner cabin, and through that presentation, they can see more or less the concept. Because when I create a concept for one thing, I decline for, through the boat with variation, but this is one thing. So after the first presentation, for a boat like that, it takes six months, the development of the design, and the construction, two years. For a bigger boat, like 100 meters, for example, is more than one year to develop the design. The whole boat is first very elegant. It is uh, quite a big boat, but it's not just a big boat. It's a boat that gives you a passion. However, yachts like Salute don't get built overnight. A boat like this has a construction delivery time approximately 30, 31 months after the contract. That means from now that uh, you can have something like this uh, for the summer 2011. Top designer Remy Tissier has several of his creations on display at Monaco, including Parcival III, also a Perini Navi built boat. At 177 foot long, she won the coveted International Super Yacht Design Award in 2006. It's very difficult to explain what is your dream because everybody has a dream, but it's impossible to formalize that dream. So we need to we need to feel by the sensation how this could be possible. I had a very clear mind because uh, I had been dreaming about this for many, many years. So you are basically in the dream business, dream scenario when you build a boat like this. She is the optimal what you can build these days. She has um, carbon fiber mast, carbon fiber boom. She's built in aluminium all the way through. So she is of that kind of class, a very fast sailing yacht. Probably the, the fastest that the Perini Navi have built so far. Parsival III is undoubtedly a yacht of extraordinary achievement in design and craftsmanship. But what was the experience of having her built like? And more importantly, what does she like to actually own? First, the, the, the owner is a couple. And they, they want the same thing, but they, they don't say the same words. This boat here we did together, me, uh, my wife Nina. Uh, we had a lot of uh, constructive, um, you don't use the word fights, but we had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, processes going on. So I create a very strong, maybe, atmosphere. This is the yin and the yang, the black and the white. It's a very hard, tough process to build a, a yacht like this. Uh, you're talking about a total project building time for around five years. So the process is quite uh, interesting and difficult, but I think we do something very special at the end. She is always an escape because you are getting into a different world when you get on board her. I mean, just the whole environment of being on the sea is, of course, uh, much different to uh, our daily job. Four years after, we are like a family with the owner. We're still very, very good friends with uh, Rémi Tichet, uh, and uh, we always speak about new ideas, new challenges, and he always has new design ideas. So this is uh, something who give me a little more confidence for the future. As Parcival Three, her crew and owner wait patiently for a new owner with 38 million euros to step forward, 
It's important to remember that the Monaco Yacht Show isn't just an event to buy and sell super yachts. It's where designers, builders and owners find inspiration for future projects. Just nice to see in the flesh some of the, the designs that were a bit unusual and a bit special. And, and maybe, it, you know, we've only seen it in a magazine and then you see it here and, and it sort of vindicates or otherwise whether in fact it was a successful uh, solution. They're very challenging projects. It's kind of difficult to, to, to start from a blank piece of paper, shall we say, with someone's dream. So you end up with a, a list of what someone's dream requirements might be, and then you try and make that work. Right down to knives, forks, spoons, um, tissue boxes, napkin rings, baseball caps, every single thing that's got um, human attachment to it, we, we design. So from the ground up, you, you've got the basic plans of the boat you have to produce, and then after then comes the superstructure styling, and after that comes the whole livable space and the finishes and the interior design. So it's a, it's a very challenging process. British designer David Lindley has been designing the interiors and furnishings of English houses for 23 years. So popular have his interior designers become that super yacht owners are coming to him more and more. One of the first experiences that we had in yachting was to do an entire design uh, interior uh, for a sailing yacht, uh, which absolutely fascinated me, which is much more to do with not only the materials, but also how you, you feel a long time at sea, what kind of things calm you down, but also that your room uh, is moving at um, 20 degrees that way and that way. And how do you make sure that nothing will open, like drawers will fall open or the maximizing of space and so forth. All these kinds of things that you know, previously would have been impossible to have dreamt about, particularly on a sailing boat, are now quite practical options to offer, keeping in touch with the office. You can now have a room that will basically be like your office in London. The electronics that are now available make, you know, the ability to get constant um, television and email and telephone uh, from the middle of the Atlantic. Because I find the way that people sit very interesting. People always congregate in places that they feel psychologically comfortable. So is it the front of the boat? Is it the back of the boat? Is the wind annoying you? Is it going to be, you know, how do you look after the wind? The wind's always a problem on a boat. How do you make it so you can be outside but not too hot? How can you be in the shade without the wind? All these kinds of things you have to think about. The temptation to do something too much is strong because you have no limit. The limit is the technique. Previously, you would have bought a yacht and been very happy with what you were given. I think people are becoming much more particular about every single part of it. So we're basically like a chef with lots of ingredients, putting them all together and making it delicious. It's like a cake. If you put too much cream, they're very rich. But it's just too much. You cannot eat that. The main thing for us is, is to be able to question some of the first principles. Traditionally, a little bit like caravans and some other forms of transport and so on, it's been very stuck in a certain accepted norm. So yachts have tended to look very similar, same bows, same sterns, you know, same concept. And, and then suddenly now we're all exploring, does it have to be like that? And the nice thing is, some of the, the clients now sort of expect it for the first time. They actually push us, you know, can you do something that's a bit special for my yacht? Will Monaco remain the number one show? Yes, I think it will. Monaco is, is a great place. Yes, it's maybe a little bit crazy. It's fun, this sort of of show is, is uh, when you realize the world. This is a small world, quite unbelievable. And there's just something about the, this area that makes it one of the special shows. There are other shows, of course, but this is the, the Superyacht show, and I think it will always remain so. Mm -hmm.